what were you endeavoring to do with this film? What were your goals when you set out to, to make the film? Well, this film actually took a really long time to make. And so when we first were thinking about it, it was right after Trump was elected, was when we were like actually in the process of sort of developing the material. But I think then a lot of the things that we were going to cover or a lot of the fears people had about the future and, and their relationship to the past, they were very theoretical. And this was a very, the, the discourse was theoretical. And now we come to today when many of the fears that a lot of the experts we spoke to had then have been realized. And so it's actually, uh, um, yeah, the, the, the film isn't, it, it sort of kind of captured not just the past, but also this living history. Ultimately, as filmmakers, we always want to contribute to, to conversation in society about like issues we care about. And um, in 2015 and 2016, we filmed for our last film in, in Germany, and we encountered these um, huge right-wing movements that were very new. And we filmed like large marches of like 30,000 people carrying torches, chanting, lying press, you know, which is right out of the Nazi playbook. And that was very disturbing. So we, we, we felt there was a need to address this somehow. And that was ultimately the motivation um, to make that film. So you took Sebastian Hafner's film as your, as your starting point, why? Well, um, the, the, move, uh, the book was written in the, or it was published in the late seventies during the, the or the many Hitler waves, the so-called Hitler wave, you know, when Hitler first after World War II became like this kind of pop icon. Um, many, many books have been published at this time about him and since then, of course, you know, and mostly um, the historians were focused on a biographical approach to Hitler. And what sets Sebastian Hoffner's book apart is not only is it not like 12,000 pages long, um, it's like a really slim book of 100 um, 80 pages, and he focuses not on on Hitler, uh, on, on his characters, but on what he actually did. And um, we always thought that it's much more um, relevant to look at history from that perspective. Um, so you have, you assembled quite quite an impressive cast of characters. I mean, can you can you tell us who who you talk to and 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 uh, who appears in your film? So ultimately, um, we looked for like the the best experts in the field, right? So um, Yehuda Bauer is like the expert on Holocaust studies. Um, Saul Friedlander is like the expert on um, on the history of the Third Reich. And then from there on, we ventured and further we um, reached out to Martin Amos because we knew that he was an original fan of the of Hafner's book, for instance. There was Amos and then they were like trying, you know, I was trying to find, um, yeah, really somewhat exceptional and often um, sort of more eccentric points of view. There's Klaus Tavelite, um, the um, German who wrote this book called Male Fantasies in the 70s, which is sort of like a cult classic. And that's something that like mainstream audiences haven't been exposed to, but like his, his theories, um, probably now more than ever, they very much are, um, yeah, they're very timely and pressing. Uh, you even have David Irving <laughs> in your film. <laughs> yeah, so we had a long debate if you make a film about the meaning of Hitler. So you have, yeah, you have your cast of experts, writers, cultural figures talking to you. And then um, do you- Don't forget about Hafner. Include that, yes, and Hafner, um, had encounters in the 60s and 70s with um, Irving himself a few times. And in the book, he actually talks about him also. He took, he was one of the first one who actually um, pointed out how dangerous these revisionist views of Irving are. So then we decided, yeah, we should reach out to him. That's what we did. So can you explain the, the um the notion of okay the, let's let's talk after having made this film and i have watched it last night and i'm still trying to digest it uh, i need to watch it a couple more times to really understand what you guys are doing with it 
um, we're talking about where does this come from? This, you know, where does something like Hitler come from? This weaponization of, of, of hate and victimhood. Uh, what is it? Give us some historical context. Why, why, does, why does, did such a thing happen? Well, we are not the historians, right? <laughs> um, why does it happen? So Hitler was able to, to um, after he discovered that he actually has a talent for public speaking, he was somehow able to um, channel this perceived victimhood of a large portion of, of Germans back in the 20s and 30s into, into this movement. And he was saying things which obviously many people also thought and felt, and he gave them permission to think all these, to think all the hatred they had inside of them. And ultimately he gave them permission to act on it. And that was a huge draw because, yeah, obviously that was a, a draw for them. And um, autocrats today do similar things. You know, they tap into, I say perceived victimhood over and over again, but they tap into that of that parts of society feel feel as victims, although they clearly aren't. And um, they give them, they, they bring them together, you know, and they give them an outlet of their, ultimately their fears and channel them into. They give them an objective, an object for their hatred to like focus it. But at the same time, and I think it's super fascinating is this idea of promising people a future and it's always sort of like this imagined, well, if only if, then we would have this future. And it's always something that's a little bit elusive. Um, and still to this day, that's being used. So like, you know, make America great again um, is not so different from sort of like a make Germany great again. It's, 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 it's really, what, one of the shocking things in talking to historians, especially the older they become, the more they simplify their explanations. And I think it really comes down to there's just something inside of us. There's like a seed of something that can be mobilized and deployed that we need to um, we need to sort of like tap down. There's like within us exists this this positive and this negative, and it's a choice that we make. And luckily, we live in democracies, and one way we c control that is by by voting. One of the ideas you explore in your movie is that uh, this fascination with Hitler and, and even talking about him, showing him, as you are doing in this film, that it perpetuates uh, the, the myth and, and triggers exactly what you're talking about now, which is the, that seed in us that can, can, can do this horror. Can you talk about that? Yeah, that's, that's a, it's an interesting, like, almost a paradox, right? So most of the footage which exists from the Third Reich was produced by the Nazis themselves. It was produced as propaganda images to uh, propagate their, their ideas of how the world would be forever, right? So this is what we have. And um, we need to be aware of that all the time. I mean, we also included some of the footage, you know, because you can't really make a film without any archival footage in it. Although, you know, conceptually that would be ultimately the great thing to do. Um, but we should discuss that and we should, yeah, we should be aware of that when we watch Triumph of the Will or whatever, this is propaganda material. That's not great filmmaking or anything. No, that's propaganda. And one needs to always keep this in the back of their minds. And the further we are from the event, the more we see this material without context. In fact, I just watched something that was newly made the other day and it's like, has wall to wall Nazi archival footage that's sort of like all with, it's not really in order. There's no real context to it. It's just sort of like this wallpaper, um, but it really does need context. I mean, you need to know what you're looking at and what was happening there. And also to see it as um, this is a completely mediated so-called reality it's not there there's very very little in fact we, we include some in the film there's very little independent uh, reportage or filming from that period it's not like people were walking around with independent cameras like they do here or that they do in, a, in, in any democracy um, and everything I, was controlled 
And then, of course, the Nazis made sure that um, there's almost no footage of the atrocities and the crimes they committed. You know, so we have this situation that we have tons of footage of the Nazis marching, the Nazis doing this and this and this, but nothing, or basically almost nothing, of the crimes they they committed. So when a person new to the subject matter discovers that universe, they only see, since everything's audiovisual these days, they only see that one that one aspect of it and they never really see the other one. And I think that's kind of dangerous because ultimately what is what is left of that time, it looks like an heroic Nazi universe and everything else kind of falls off the table. So that's very tricky. Well, you know, they were, their propaganda is, is I mean, it was quite brilliant and it was, their, their use of graphics was, was quite stunning actually, especially for the, for the time. I mean, they were using elements of art to create propaganda. Um, you, you have chosen also to use very bold graphics, uh, um, words like, uh, totalitarianism, Hitler, every, all these words, very bold, filling out the screen with red colors, bright, bright red colors, which they loved. Can you explain? <laughs> well, you know, the communists also love bright red colors. So it's like not, Hitler doesn't own red. <laughs> um, and it's a very effective tool of communication. And you know, since like everyone has a, and many people have a very short attention span. We felt the need that we need to um, underline certain certain phrases or words in the film. And there's, I mean, there's also a discourse going on with some of those words. Um, you know, like there's a whole discourse going on about, you know, is it fascism yet? You know, well, I mean, to me, it's sort of like, you know, if it looks like fascism and sounds like fascism, well, then it probably is fascism. And certainly we encountered that um, during our filming trips, it's like that that's what you, you know, believe what you're seeing. This is not, um, you know, your mind is not playing tricks. These people are actually marching at night with torches. Look what we saw in Charlottesville. I mean, it's unbelievable that people were marching in line with torches chanting blood and soil. How is that possible? And I think that's another motivation for making the film. How, how could it be that like educated young Americans are out doing that, that shows a complete failure of teaching history. And what, and what, what, did, what do you think, I mean, have, having made this movie, what is the answer to that question? How is it possible? How is this, how is this possible in, in Europe, a place of, how is it possible in the first place? And how is it possible that it's coming back now? I think what we learned, especially from the historians, um, is that these movements are always present, you know, and um, we were probably under the illusion, you know, after 1989, when the wall came down, Berlin Wall came down, and the end of history was declared, we all felt so good about that and um, didn't expect something like that to happen 30 years later. And um, yeah, so what we learned, it's always present, you know, and um, we have to be vigilant one way or the other to, to, to deal with these forces, because it's not only, there isn't really one answer, how is it possible? It's just always there. And we, yeah, we need to, we need to deal with it. We need to participate in society uh, in, in, in democracy because democracy is not just this thing, but is handed to us and will always be there. We actually have to um, be, take our responsibility to contribute to it. There's another funny thing about all of this is that and again, like when people, they'll say, you know, Trump is Hitler, and both of us would probably say very clearly, you know, Trump is no Hitler. Um, and it's also interesting, this time we live in, if you went back to the 20s or 30s, you know, people were really suffering in Europe. And if you look now in any Western democracy, people, most people are not really suffering. Certainly the people that are out in these movements are not really suffering. Um, and I think because for the observer, they'll, they'll say, well, you know, their, their complaints are some, somehow like we don't really want to take it seriously. Um, and then we end up in a situation like on January 6, where suddenly you have tens of thousands of people storming the Capitol. Um, and it doesn't matter <laughs> like whether they, what they believe or what, how they feel aggrieved is true or not. The fact is, is that they've been radicalized 
and that this is this is their thought world now, um, and we have to take it seriously. And how do we deal with it? Do you think? I, we should like participate in the tools what democracy gives all of us. I think that's pretty simple. Um, yeah, that's what I would do. And also, I think like following up on his thought, I mean, I don't think it's really so important to understand what these radicals, to understand them. I mean, I personally can't understand any of that. It makes no sense to me. And so um, we just need to deal with it because trying to understand them gives it also a certain validation, but we don't really want to give them. So we just need to deal with it and like stand up for whatever we think should be the, the, the world we want to live in. So yeah, participate in democracy, that's the thing. <laughs> and it's been interesting also to see that young people around the world have been standing up to it. So I feel pretty encouraged. Um, you know, there's always a line being held, whether it's in Portland or in Berlin or in Dresden or in Warsaw, there's a line being held by young people who are afraid, not afraid to stand up to, to sometimes even violence. Um, you, your previous film about Karmakstadt, Karmak City, um, was quite stunning also. Um, um, what, how do you guys go about choosing the films you make? He, oh, how are you choosing? I thought you wanted <laughs> to know how, how does it all look so great? Because he's totally responsible for making everything look great. <laughs> How do you choose about it? it uh, very often it's like subject matters which um, interest us and touch us. I mean, Comic City was a very personal story where we also feel like we can contribute to conversation, you know, in a, in a, in a larger scale. That's stories what um, also they are not just small personal stories, but they relate in a larger scale, like the um, Karl-Marx City, the Stasi uh, surveillance state of East Germany, like whatever we learned from that time has a relevance to today for pretty much anybody. Um, and I think you also want to make films, again, like you know, one, of, you know, one of the first things I said when we started the interview is um, often when you're making something, like you, know, you both make films for now and you sort of make them for later. And I don't think we ever thought that this film wouldn't just be about history, but about the present. And I think that is, is always interesting. Like it, um, it'll be interesting to watch this in five or 10 years and see um, sort of what happened. 